Hi, morning, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, business COVID-19 webinar for offices. Uh, just to let everybody know that uh, the webinar will be recorded and we'll publish it after the event on the council, three council websites. Um, little disclaimers, views expressed on the speakers alone don't necessarily represent UK government or body speaker represents. You'll hear a little bit of the science around virus transmission, that just to give you some context to some of the guidance you read or the views that you hear today. Um, this is being brought to you by the Regulatory Services Partnership, Council Owned Service. We're covering the boroughs of Merton, Richmond and Wandsworth. We have over 50 uh, staff that cover the main regulatory bodies that you would come into contact with. And um, amongst the range of other consumer protection issues that we deal with uh, and enforce uh, is the COVID regulations. Now, just to put your mind at rest, because you may have queries now or after the event, uh, you know, we are here to support business. Um, you know, 99% of all our interactions are about giving business the right advice to get things right. Uh, I highlight that because I'm, we're, we're conscious that, um, uh, you know, some of the media suggests we're the business police. Um, that's very much uh, not the case. So if you've got a concern, got a query, you know, feel um, reassured to give us a call uh, and we'll try and help you as much as we can. Uh, speakers today are myself, Paul Maloszewski reed I'm in the Trading Standards section. We've also got a host of other council officers from Health and Safety, our Regulation Department, Economic Delivery. Uh, so between us all, we should hopefully answer all of your questions. So a little bit of an overview, uh, we'll be touching on the government um, guidance, financial and uh, mental health and other support available to businesses, practical steps to reduce the risk in your office premise, touch on PPE, uh, touch on the queries that were posted around staff, you know, what if staff have COVID and need to self-isolate, um, and then there'll be a Q&A with the panel. So just to highlight, everybody except the speakers are, are muted uh, throughout. After the presentation, you guys will get a chance to ask your questions. If you want to, just raise your hand, press the raise hand button, and then you will be unmuted after we say your name. Uh, if you do want to speak, it's great if you can turn on the camera. Uh, and meanwhile, please just use a chat function to share your views, concerns, queries as we go, and we'll try and feature those into the uh, presentation. So um, it, it essentially, you know, what every business has always had to do with any risk in your premise is to do a risk assessment. Every employer has this legal responsibility, protect your workers, protect your customers that come into your premise um, from the, any risks to their health and safety. So COVID-19 is a hazard, just needs to be managed like any other hazard that we have out there. Food premises have to deal with food viruses. There's things, there's a range of other airborne diseases. So these are things that some businesses will have uh, more experience dealing with uh, than others. Um, you need to identify those hazards in your premise and then do a suitable assessment to look at the risk and how do you control and minimize those risks. Now, um, there is a risk assessment templates that appear here and we'll send some follow-up information which will include a link to those templates. So if you just go through that, that should pretty much cover most of the concerns um, and controls that you need to think about. Um, so that's your legal responsibility, yes, under health and safety laws. And then you've got government guidance which helps each sector try and interpret what does that mean for me? So what are the potential risks, you know, pinch points in a typical business of your kind, and then government within their sector guidance tries to give you some practical advice of things that you can consider to minimise those risks. So uh, within the government guide, um, it's worth having a look to see if you can download the guide because the PDF version offers also tick box checklists um, throughout the guidance so that can make things easier. Uh, guidance was updated just the other week. I haven't checked whether it's still including tick box checklists, so um, that may not be uh, available on your sector guide. It's also worth looking at your trade association guides because typically what we found in doing these talks to the range of sectors is that your own trade association has, uh, you know, tries to interpret and uh, personalize 
advice just for your sector. They also do FAQs covering the main queries concerns that they've uh, uh, come up from their members. So that's also worth having a look at. Uh, we're touching on mental health, uh, numerous reasons for this. It, it, it interlinks with so many of the things that um, you need to think about um, as part of your uh, risk assessment. Mental health, you need to consider it in terms of risk assessment because there's a requirement to do a staff consultation. And that isn't really just about doing a tick box exercise. You know, we now, you know, a year on that uh, mental health is a problem. Um, looking at and considering mental health in your premise will have an impact on practicalities of how people work. It will touch on the questions that we get from many of you around full capacity. When can we bring every back, everybody back to the office? Um, it also has an impact on productivity. You know, if employers or your staff are stressed, whether they're in or out of the office, that has been recognised to have an effect on uh, how they work. Now, Consultation was uh, a legal requirement, but you know you shouldn't be doing it just simply because of the law. If cut, there is a uh, you know quite a lot of employees that have anxiety about returning to work. Uh, so if there isn't a proper consultation, letting people know what measures you're looking at to keep them safe, that will possibly cause conflict between employer and employees, and may uh, lead to peer uh, conflict as well. Um, just to give you a, a feel for, you know, what's what's kind of happening out there, which will some of these uh, will be relevant to your employees. In a normal year, one in four of us is experiencing some sort of mental health problems. But now, uh, because of what's been happening in the last 15 months, the mental health bodies are saying we're, we're suffering a mental health epidemic. Um, now, that may sound like an exaggeration if you look at some of the employer or in trade body surveys. So you may have done your own surveys, depending on how big your business is. And those typically show the normal figures that about 40% of people are saying they're concerned about their mental health. Um, it's worth just highlighting if you have done your own survey and looking to rely on that to, to think whether you need to consider support for your staff. Um, most people don't like talking about mental health. And as you can imagine, most employees are reluctant to tell their employer that they are suffering in some way uh, mentally because of the stigma around that. So it's worth, I'm going to give you know more information on this in the follow-up, but this is perhaps closer to the reality of what your employees are feeling, you know, 70 to 90% of uh, working mums or, or men who will be working for you have been experiencing stress, depression, anxiety. So this obviously has an impact on everybody. You're trying to run a business. Um, you you're obviously need to think about your own health to help uh, make sure you're making the best decisions and you can focus on uh, driving your business forward. But it's worth bearing in mind these things for all the your staff who will have these concerns about financial issues, isolation, fears around the virus and serious illness. Now the financial concerns, we're going to signpost you guys to financial help, so that will deal with that. Isolation, uh, thankfully, you know, we're now starting to reopen, so that will deal with those issues. Um, the fears around the virus will be around for many months, probably after the, the sector reopens and when, even at the point when everybody comes back to work. Um, you know, there is a lot of fear generated in the media, yeah, unfortunately sensationalizing sensationalization sells, uh, so you don't always get uh, a more rounded uh, kind of picture of, uh, of the, uh, the issue. Um, and I, I just picked up one example here. Um, you may remember this uh, super spreader event at beaches when we all reopened in the summer. There was a lot of sensationalization that you can't go out, you can't go down the beach. Um, it'll lead to all these uh, horrible um, uh, super spreader events. Whereas if you look at what the scientists, government scientists said afterwards, um, you know, it's minimal risk in theory and actually non-existent in practice. No examples of that happening anywhere around the world. The other thing that's, uh, you know, these concerns and feelings that I was talking about, um, you know, everybody's got them. We're all seeing the news. Um, uh, but again, give some context and it will touch on what I mentioned later about risk and risk assessment. Um, 
most people when surveyed say they think uh, you know people in their 50s or 60s are, are the ones that are at risk whereas the average age of somebody dying from COVID is 82 and a half and the average life expectancy in the UK is 81. So it is still as we were told at the beginning it is the most vulnerable the elderly at most at risk. So most people and these are the ones that come to work for you will have these concerns, but there's ways that you can do, uh, you can kind of alleviate those concerns. And looking just in the context of working age people, which will be your staff that are, are may have concerns when you start to talk about bringing more of them back into the office. Uh, and I know many of you have talked about wanting to work as normal and have full capacity at the office. Um, in terms of working age people, just over 500 working age people without underlying conditions uh, died due to COVID in, a, in uh, 2020. Um, so that is, you know, you're you're looking at two to three times more likely to be uh, die of, in a car accident than you are of COVID. So that gives you some perspective that unfortunately is missing in much of the, the media stories that they like to push out there. You'll get some follow-up information about information apps that are useful to for employers to, to share with employees, contacts, groups for um, uh, various adults and young people. Bear in mind, although working age people may be coming uh, and working in your office, they will have families, they will have young people. So it is worth looking at mental health in a very rounded fashion. So, um, that's quite a lot there, but it's, you're going to see how it, it, it links in with other things that we talk about. So practical tip to reduce risk indoors. We've heard about UV lights, cleaning, ventilation, social distance, mask screens. So let's talk about those each one, uh, one at a time. UV light, you may have seen there was um, uh, comments in the media that 90% of the virus can be killed off in sunlight. Oh, um, sorry, Paul, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Ellie. Um, Hello. Do, you, do you want to share your presentation at this point? Whoa, I'm very sorry. Very sorry, guys. Um, sorry, bear with me one minute. Okay, can you guys see that now? Yes, yes. Okay, there has been slides all the way up until now. Do apologize for that. Um, you will get the information that I've been running through in much more detail. Obviously we can't go into detail about any of the things we talk about to, to any great extent within an hour. So you will get a lot of this, but you can do a deep dive in it later. Okay, um, so some businesses have asked about will we buy these UV light sterilizers? So you see in the picture here, there's UV lighting uh, in the ceiling. Some businesses have asked, should they bring those sorts of things in? Um, there is a lot of scam UV lights being sold online. You, those are not safe to use, as well as killing the virus, they're harmful to humans. So that's a big no-no. Uh, cleaning, obviously we've been talked to, told about cleaning uh, right from the start. Um, the advice on that will probably change in, in the guidance in months to come. Um, the, what the scientists say now is that transmission uh, on surfaces is virtually impossible. Again, you, you can get the detail of why in the guidance. There's no reported cases of this happening. Um, therefore, excessive cleaning um, isn't going to be something that you should be focusing your resources on. You still need to do all your normal, you know, normal hygiene practices of washing hands, uh, cleaning things like doorknobs, etc. Your normal cleaning within the office, but excessive cleaning um, was really only important if vomit surface transmission was seen as a, a you know, as a, a real risk. So you may have in your office, you might have clients that come to waiting areas. So that touches on that. You know, do you um, still lay out, lay out magazines or drinks? in those waiting areas, that is fine. Um, in terms of, there isn't an SST to use reusable cups, you just wash cups as normal if uh, different staff, different customers are using those. Obviously in the context of staff, um, 
bearing in mind, yeah, every office will be different. You may have had a shared set of cutlery um, uh, crockery before. Because of staff anxiety around around the, the health issues, some may be more uh, you know wanting to come in and use their own cups. So things might need to be. This is kind of level of detail you need to consider in everything about your normal ways of working before and how the anxieties of staff, even if even if there's not a risk, a real risk there, uh, staff anxiety will still mean that you need to consider these things. And it might just be that you need to um, inform uh, your staff why you're work, going to work in a certain way or the same way that you used to work previously in certain regards. Um, the key thing with reducing risk indoors is ventilation. So aerosols can remain you know, uh, uh, floating around in the air for several hours in an unventilated space. Um, a study uh, looking at a different airborne virus in a different country found that just by only by improving ventilation and bringing it into a certain level, that they reduced the transmission by 97%. Yeah, so it's a it's a huge uh, uh, area that you should focus on within an office. Again, in terms of any questions around what does that mean in practice, what does good ventilation mean? You may have air conditioning units and want to know how many liters per second, uh, what kind of rate you need to uh, have your uh, air con on at. That's picked up in the detail that gets circulated. <clears throat> Ventilation, also you get a link to uh, some guidance from aerosol air conditioning experts, which gives 15 practical tips. It includes things like uh, answers questions around, can you use fans, can you use air con? Those are fine, as long as the air con isn't just recirculating the air. It tells you to focus on things uh, in, you know, in, in the unventilated spaces. You might have basements, you might have rooms where it's impossible for you to get good ventilation. So you need to think about limiting uh, or stopping staff spending time in those areas. Toilets are uh, usually a, an area with poor ventilation because uh, usually you don't have windows. That's uh, another area to consider. Um, PP, do you need to wear face coverings? Uh, it's not a legal requirement. It's, it's not you know, appeared in the guidance because obviously it's, uh, it, you know, the context is, uh, you know, staff are working there seven, eight hours. Um, plus, if you have ventilation, and I and I refer you to the example in the gym sector, gym users never had to wear face coverings. And the reason is uh, Sage and Public Health England came along, looked at uh, particular gyms and looked at the level of ventilation. And they said, as long as ventilation is slightly better than what we're requesting in the likes of retail and offices, then it's acceptable. Uh, it's you know minimal risk to gym users um, if the ventilation is a certain level. Face shields and screens um, are really relevant in terms of stopping large sneeze cough droplets, but they don't do anything about these tiny speech aerosols. You know when we talk and uh, and breathe out, those are the ones that float around in the air for a long time. So your Screens or face shields don't stop that. It's ventilation that uh, helps reduce that risk. You, if you use gloves before for certain handling certain materials, chemicals, you still use gloves uh, now, but you don't need to use gloves, uh, you know, just because of COVID. As I say, that was a, a concern when we thought vomit surface transmission was a big issue. Uh, and gloves are not recommended because of the false sense of security they can give the wearer. Now, the you might have an office where you can't, you know, you haven't got access to open to open window and doors. Maybe you haven't got air con. Um, so you might be thinking, and, and even if you have, you might still be considering where, where do people sit? How far away do they sit from each other? So, Bearing in mind, you know, there's two key factors that, that help facilitate transmission between different people. One is viral load. How much does somebody breathe in of the virus particles? So it's not just simply a case of if you stand next to somebody for one, you know, one meter away uh, you're, and they've got COVID that you get it. You need to be within uh, near them for a certain level of time for them to breathe out the virus for that a second person to breathe in. So this is why time is a critical factor. 
um, you know, to say if you're around near, near somebody, and that's less than two meters away, for 15 minutes or more, that is the point that you need to be considering, you know, some sort of risk mitigation measures. Um, for aerosols, I've mentioned that large droplets. So in terms of large droplets and to some extent the aerosols, um, seat configuration will be, uh, you know, something that you need to consider. Previously, you may have had some of the staff sitting, you know, directly face to face, a meter, meter and a half away, depending on your setup. You need to, wherever possible, you're trying to get staff to sit side by side because when they're breathing out, the particles are going forward. Um, or you're you're looking to sit them back to back wherever you can. Um, screens, you know, uh, is is likely a consideration of yours. As hopefully I've touched on earlier, there if the ventilation is really good uh, and you've already considered seat configuration, you're not uh, you know you don't necessarily have to buy screens. It will com it completely depend on your setup there. In terms of questions around when can you get back to normal, when can you bring in uh, all staff to full capacity, there is no set uh, number of how many staff you can have in an office. Each business needs to make their own risk assessment. And this touches on, uh, you know, what part of the reason why I, I went into a bit more detail on the mental health section, because you look at the, the risk in, in comparison with many other things out there that we all, uh, we all look at risk controls for. Uh, and the risk to the average working age person is you know, very minimal. Um, even if somebody gets the virus, uh, most people will not display any symptoms and they will not uh, suffer uh, any great illness from it. Um, so these, when you look, this, this is all about risk control. Yeah, you need to think about these things um, to reduce the risk as much as you can. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, out of everything you're doing, focus on ventilation would be my key takeaway for, from today. Uh, staff testing is um, something that businesses are thinking about. There is a link there for employers to order uh, lateral flow tests. Employers can also, and there is a there is some offer happening now where sectors can uh, get free tests sent out from government. Um, whether or not you uh, get those free tests, and, and after that free test uh, offer goes, you uh, there is on the open market um, access to uh, PCR and lateral flow tests. You may be wondering which one you should buy. So it's worth bearing in mind, PCR test is very, very sensitive. Um, it picks up um, those who have minimal virus inside them, so are not a risk of transmitting to others. And also uh, some scientists have said it even picks up fragments of the virus. So somebody that might have had it and their immune system dealt with it, they may still show uh, as being positive if you have a PCR test. Um, this is why the likes of World Health Organization have been uh, pushing countries to look at lateral flow tests, because those folk, those actually look at not just yes or no, have you got the virus, but have you got, uh, uh, you know, what are you likely to be at a level where you're transmitting to others? And that happens a little bit before symptoms and a little bit after uh, the onset of symptoms. Uh, vaccinations, you know, you may see some employers uh, talking about they're going to change the staff rules uh, to make sure all the staff are vaccinated. And um, other sectors have been thinking, will we have days where we allow vaccinated customers in versus non-vaccinated customers? So, the, you know, those things are out there in the media. You would have seen them and you may have these same kind of quandaries yourself. So two things to, to kind of think about here. Um, one is looking at the survey of around 70,000 people, some of which will be, you know, your typical staff, 19% of uh, working age people, 30 to 60, said they're, they feel uh, that they don't want to take the vaccine, and around 29% of um, young adults uh, who may be working in your office are also thinking that they are, said they are unlikely to take the virus. 
So you need to bear in mind there is still fears and uncertainty around there. So if you were considering bringing any mandatory policy for staff, you're going to come across some of those people that are very anxious. That's one thing, uh, which will obviously cause conflict in the in the office. And the second thing is, um, as you'll pick up in the, the link that we signpost you to, there is a range of potential legal arguments around discrimination, human rights, etc. So that's for staff. Similar potential legal hurdles may come up for customers. So you may have waiting areas and be thinking, will you have some sort of policy that deals with who can come into your waiting area? So there's a range of legal and ethical problems around that. Um, to let you, you guys know, there is some things being done around this. So government did a two week public consultation that just ended the, the other week. Um, asking what people thought in terms of the ethical and legal quandaries. So government is having a look at this, whether they change laws to uh, you know, make it mandatory for people to have testing or to have the vaccine. Um, so what I'd say is hold fire, don't try and implement anything yourself, um, and wait to see what comes out nationally from government in that regard. Um, there is some changes around uh, QR codes that's mostly relevant to all the other sectors. Um, the, the NHS guidance was saying it may be something that you may need to consider if you've got high number of external visitors coming into a certain area, then you can consider it. And, and if you need to do that, there's a link there. Um, bringing customers back, perhaps less relevant to you. Again, there's a whole mix of people watching this. So again, this is for those who have clients coming in, you may find that, you know, uh, remote working or uh, sorry, remote communication with clients is working great, but some customers still like face to face, but they may still have these fears about coming back. This is why it might be relevant for you to have some sort of information on your own website that's easily accessible to your customers to tell them about what steps, measures have you put in place to create a safe uh, environment for them to come and visit. Do, uh, do bear in mind not everybody, customers or staff, is comfortable talking about these concerns they may have. So you may, you may think you've done everything right, you've done all the, followed all the guidance, everything is safe. But um, if that's either not being communicated effectively enough to all your staff or, or clients, or, um, or they, they may not feel comfortable telling you, and that they still have those anxieties. This is why it might be helpful to do some sort of anonymous uh, feedback. <clears throat> Financial um, support. So this is a bit of a minefield, appreciate that. Um, if you go to this link, just by filling in five, six questions on type of business, number of employees, you will get uh, signposted to all of the relevant uh, financial support that's available to your business. Um, so very good place to start, and that will tailor your the answers to the questions you your, you answer. <clears throat> there is also a fairly new government recovery advice service that was set up several months back, which uh, gives you free or, or cheap access to accounting, advertising, HR advice. That's another kind of practical measure that's in place to help businesses. Uh, to restart it and survive. Um, <clears throat> it's worth probably mentioning self-isolation rules. So again, there'll be a link to give you all the details and what gets followed up. But just two things I'd highlight. One is, uh, you know, staff need to isolate. Uh, you need to consider sick pay, like, you know, any other illness that they may have to be off for. And there is a government £500 support payment for those that need to self-isolate to help. Um, you know, to help them uh, comply with those requirements. You need to also think about quarantine if your staff are traveling. Uh, so have some policies around that. Think about that if that comes up. Um, in terms of further help, uh, as I said at the beginning, we cover those three London boroughs. So if you are watching this online and you're a business based outside Richmond, Merton or Wandsworth, um, please contact your local authorities, environmental health department for uh, further advice. So I'm going to, oh, there's one, there's one other thing that we wanted to mention, which is around, uh, for Richmond customers, uh, Richmond businesses rather, I will uh, 
ask Ravina or Angela to pick that up so we make sure we, we give you the, the right information on that. So we're, that's it from me. Um, we're going to open it up to questions. This can be to either of us in trading standards. Um, we've got health and safety officers. We've got economic uh, recovery team uh, on board. So any questions about any of this, uh, then please raise your hand and or put something in the chat. Now, while people are thinking about that, Ravina or Angela, could you just um, remind me the um, offer that's been made to Richmond businesses? Um, hi, Paul. Hi, everybody. Um, it's Angela. Um, just to say that if you're a Richmond business, um, the email that's going to be sent out by Ravina later today is actually going to give you a link to the Visit Richmond website where you can be um, promoting your business for free. And then also, um, if you have any of the businesses that have got um, independent businesses within who are unique and special, then they can also be doing an offer on the Richmond card. But all of that will be um, on the email that will be sent out later today. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. And is there anything else, um, anything extra, any of my other colleagues in the panel would want to uh, mention before we, we open it up for Q&A? No, fine. Okay, so um, appreciate that's a lot to take in. Um, we, we were trying to summarize it more to give you guys more room for, for questions. So anything and anything that uh, comes up, practical con considerations, things that you're thinking about, measures that you want to put in place, but not sure if they will adequately cover um, practice staff, please uh, you know, mention it in the chat or raise your hand. And just to, again, remind you guys, everybody's muted at the moment, so you need to raise your hand if you have a question. Okay. So, um, what will, oh, when can offices open is one of the queries. Uh, so, offices were, um, so the rules, guidance changed on the 29th um, to talk about um, rather than staying uh, you know at home you can stay local so because of that there's likely more uh, staff that are thinking about returning to work or more employers able to do that without changing rules offices uh, are you know are open have been open since the start there's simply been an emphasis on encouraging staff to work from home. So this has been from the start, start. Staff should have been encouraged to work from home as much as possible, only where their job doesn't allow them. And this would include things like there isn't a the technology in place to allow them to work, should they then uh, be coming into the office. Um, you, does, that, does anybody else want to pick up or, or expand on that? Yeah, so it's all about, you know, minimizing the risk as much as possible. We're trying to minimize risk. So as my colleague mentions, if it's essential for your business, to, for the office to be open, uh, then, you know, you then just need to consider, uh, do the risk assessment and think about how many people can come into that space safely, bearing in mind everything that we've discussed about, you know, making sure ventilation and, uh, and, uh, is good uh, and the other things that were mentioned. Can I can I answer that question, Paul? From Penny? yes, please do. Um, hi, it's Helen Clark here. Um, with regard to your staff living further afield, that's not. It's whether or not you need the staff in the office. Offices haven't, as Paul said, actually ever been fully closed. It's just the government advice was for people to stay at home as far as possible. But if you need staff in the office for various reasons, you've got new starters for training, for whatever reason, that then they are, are have always been allowed in. You just have to accommodate them safely. Yeah, and and so it is probably is if part of the staff concern was, oh well, we're not allowed to go to work because it's it's too far away. You know, they're worried about being stopped and questioned by the police, etc. The, the law has always enabled people to 
go to work as long as you had a re you know a reasonable excuse was how the law was phrased if it was reasonable and you needed to go into the office even if it was far away then you were allowed to do that um I guess what the change is now is that we're now opening up more. So it's now, you know, um, now more and more people, that, all the, I think it's 99% of the most vulnerable uh, population have been vaccinated. Some of those may have been in your employees. So that's a big change that's happened. And, you know, obviously as part of the government's roadmap to open up different sectors, um, th this is why more and more offices will now be thinking, well, you know, now is, now that these measures and steps have taken place, we can now start to ask staff to come back. You, but you should still, you know, you should still be thinking about staff working from home if they're able to do so. Um, but if they need to come in, you know, that, that they need to come in, you just need to do your risk assessment and minimize the risk. Uh, any other queries, either raise your hand and you can, We'll, we'll unmute you or just mention it in the chat. Um, can I just ask what Mariella means by an internal vaccine policy? Is this for your own staff? I don't know whether we can unmute. Yeah, yeah. So this is, um, you know, what you know what was mentioned earlier that so, some employers have started to think about will we have some sort of policy that uh, you know requires certain staff or all staff to have a vaccination before they come into work. Um, you know, the two things that you need to be thinking about, one is the legal and ethical uh, concerns, um, and that's something that government is looking at. But the other thing is the risk, uh, like everything, even if it was legal, legally something that you could do, in terms of thinking about that as a, a risk control measure, you need to look at what is the risk. And, you know, the evidence, the official stats from official uh, ONS is that, just over 500 people in England and Wales of working age or their underlying conditions have died from COVID. Three times more people die in a road accident in the UK every year. So there's lots of ways you can compare that, but that when I, when I came across that stat myself, that, that's when it really kind of, in my mind, really gave me some context to this. You know, not, not a lot has changed since what we were told at the start that for most people, unless you're vulnerable or unless you have some sort of underlying condition, you are not at risk from the virus. So I, I fully appreciate, you know, lots of you as employers have the same concerns everybody else has when we've been, you know, in this situation the past year of this constant fear uh, that's been around for over a year, it's going to make us anxious. Um, but really the risk is very minimal to the average person, 18 to 60, that will be working in your office you may you may decide and say government does change the law and this is something that they are looking at you may that would be the time to think about changes in policy but again it shouldn't just be a black and white everybody now needs to be vaccinated it needs to be proportionate so maybe if you've got vulnerable adults people with underlying conditions that work for you you may then be thinking well maybe i need to have a policy in place to protect them um, so that there is loads of issues, you know, there's a law, then there's ethics, you know, can you, should you force employees to do something that maybe they don't want to do? Sorry, um, Paul, it's Angela. Sorry. Hi. Yes. Um, um, I just was wanting to know if Mar Mariella wanted to be um, unmuted. So I've, I've asked her to unmute herself. Oh, Mari Mariella. No, no I'm you okay, thank you. Well. Yeah, you're oh, fine. Yeah. Okay, you're fine that's brilliant. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, brilliant. Hi, hi, Mariella. I, I think um, unless you're working with vulnerable people, it's not likely to be an issue for you. OK, completely makes sense. Thank you so much, because I okay. think I've heard of other companies potentially starting the process of initiating some sort of internal policy. And I just thought maybe would we need to start doing that as well? I don't think yeah. you, you don't need to start to. And I think, as Paul said, you, you're on quite sticky ground if you're going to stop yeah. making it compulsory un unless there is a really a risk associated with the work that they do. And in, in an office, and as I said, unless you're meeting vulnerable clients, that's unlikely to be the case. Okay. Yeah. And again, just to you know, give a little bit more context, uh, this is, it's really unfortunate, this is the world that we live in. We, there is a lot of sensationalization in the media. So if you actually look at you know, this situation about vaccination policy, 
most trade sectors and the professional bodies represent all these different industries are really against, uh, you know, making it mandatory for staff or customers to be vaccinated. And it's, there's the odd one employer uh, that then gets splashed across the media that was considering this. But they, they are very, very much the minority of employers. Um, most employers are looking at this, at, you know, in terms of risk, it's low. And, and do you want to be getting into ethical legal challenges? And even that aside, do you want to have that conflict between you as an employer and employees um, when there is, you know, very, very little risk? As I say, if, you, if you're concerned about vaccinating employees, you'll need to have a policy to stop people driving because they're two mm -hmm. to three times more likely to be in a dive in a, you know, in a car accident than they are to, to die of COVID. So, you know, put it in perspective. Uh, uh, is what we need to do for these things. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, will you share the slides? So what what we have is we, we are recording the presentation. So this will go up on all three uh, council websites. You will then get uh, follow-up information more important now with this webinar because uh, unfortunately I didn't realize I hadn't shared this, the uh, slides <laughs> at the beginning. So um, you will get the detail and all the things that we've been speaking about. Um, so, and, and we think the follow-up information probably, uh, well, it, the webinar will go online uh, on Richmond site at least on Monday but we then need to share it with the other two councils that we uh, we are partnered with. And I would expect, you know, within seven days, it'll be on the other two council websites. The follow-up information that should come up out um, in terms of the detailed information, hopefully within seven, 10 days tops, that will be emailed to everybody that was uh, registering. Um, so um, one of the other um, comments uh, within the, uh, chat. Let's just have a look at this. Yeah. So, um, you know, somebody else just mentioning um, in terms of uh, hesitancy, uh, you know, just uh, adding a little bit more to what I mentioned in there in terms of some staff not wanting to take the vaccine. So even if the law gets changed, one of the, uh, the people listening has just mentioned about uh, the, the 16 to 29 year old group being very hesitant. Uh, and they mentioned um, ONS, that's Office of National Statistics figures, talking about 17% being hesitant. Um, the survey I referred to was a survey of 70,000 people. So different from ONS that's been done in terms of, men it's, been look it's looking at everything, mental health, people's attitudes to vaccinations, uh, certification policies, lots of things to do with coronavirus. So it's a significantly substantial amount of people that's been uh, surveyed and, and that showed about 28% of young adults under 30 or has, you know, said it's for them, they think it's very unlikely they'll take a vaccine. So that's their feeling. And also bearing in mind all the signs tell us those, that age group is low risk. You know, those, the, the younger you are, the less you are at risk. This is a risk to people that are elderly. The average age of death is 82.4 years old. Yeah. So the, the average age of people that die from this is a little bit higher than the average age that people die in the UK. Yeah. So yes, we will send out the follow-up information so you can get that. And by all means, you know, you know, use this and what, when you're trying to share and, and put your staff's uh, mind at ease. Because I was, these concerns that we hear from in the webinars, we've done uh, four now, and we talk to businesses week in, week out. You know, we're hearing these same concerns from many businesses in different uh, sectors. And it's exactly the same concerns that we had as individuals. So I was one of those people that was anxious and telling my family and kids to got, have the face masks on and, and, and talking to restaurant owners when I went out for a meal, asking them about the ventilation. So it, it is normal in this very strange times. And when we are 
uh, you know, having that fear week in, week out and, and seeing the number of people dying, it is natural that we will be concerned and anxious. And this is what, this, these are the thoughts that would be going through the minds of your employees. They might not tell you this, but all of the surveys say, you know, mental health has been severely impacted from everybody of every sort of age group for numerous reasons, yeah. Um, so other questions in the chat, will the follow-up include resources you mentioned? Yes, it'll include links to the templates, detailed government advice, uh, reference to the surveys, yes, so you can do a deep dive on any of that information that you want. So the, the detailed information that we'll give is, you know, um, anything that you want to get into that we've talked on about, you'll get in the follow-up information. And also, if that doesn't answer your questions, I'll just also highlight for those businesses in our three boroughs, you can email foodandsafety at merchant.gov.uk and that will be picked up by uh, one of the regulatory staff. So they will be able to answer that. Any detailed questions that aren't answered in either the government guidance or the follow-up information that gets uh, sent around. Any other queries, uh, concerns, comments? Uh, no? Fine. Well, if my colleagues haven't got anything else to add, uh, we will we will close up there then. Yeah, nothing further from me, Paul. Um, and as you said, if you have any queries post this webinar, it's food and safety at merton.gov.uk and, and we're all here to help you. Great. Thank you for attending. Um, and uh, yeah, best of luck. Um, with, with your business moving forward. Thanks, bye.